Welcome to another episode of CFO Insights, as we start again after our uh, brief holiday break. As always, I'm your host, Will Bones, and in today's episode, we are diving into the topic of third-party risk management, or as we might start referring to it, uh, TPRM, during the course of this uh, this conversation. But, but simply put, uh, third-party risk management really involves managing the risks that are associated with working with other organizations and being suppliers, being service providers, joint venture partners, joint venture partners, resellers, etc. Um, As as over the last decades, companies are increasingly relying on those third parties for some of the critical activities. As a result, it is becoming ever more important to manage the risks associated with working with third parties. To, to help me navigate this complex topic and, and also the role that a CFO can play here, I've, I've invited a team of PwC experts who are in PwC Belgium uh, managing these TPRM services. So uh, I'm very happy to welcome Ben Colson and Christina Petrova here with me. Hello, Rul, and hello, everyone. Uh, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be invited by you, Rul. Um, we're happy to share some thoughts and insights into, indeed, the TPRM. Thank you, Roland. Uh, TPRM is something that keeps us busy every day, so happy to be here. Yeah, well, and, and thanks a lot for uh, taking your time to, to be here with me and uh, have, have our listeners uh, learn something about third party risk management. But I've given a very brief introduction, as, as you've been so gracious to, uh, to already give me a bit of insight. But um, perhaps, Ben, it's, it's good to also explain our audience what uh, third party risk management is. Uh, before we get into why CFO should have this on their agenda, Christina, uh, could, could you help there a bit? Oh, basically, TPRM is a formal process to mitigate risks associated with the third party, both pre-contract and post-contract. Pre-contract, you identify the risks that are relevant to the third party relationship and you perform the due diligence to assess and mitigate those risks. And post-contract, you continue to monitor the third party to be able to continuously mitigate the risk. Uh, yeah, TPRM also involves formal procedures uh, to to end the relationship, actually, if needed. Okay, good. Uh, thanks, thanks for that, uh, Christina. So, and and I have given a brief introduction already, but perhaps let's start with, with the big question on on for everyone here: Why is third party risk management now suddenly all over the place? Why has it become over the past year such a hot topic? Is it now more critical than it uh, than it has been in the past? Well, indeed, um, it's funny since I, I came back from, from PwC Canada, so I spent a couple of years there. Um, TPRM uh, has has been a hot topic, really, and I would say there are several reasons for this heightened focus on TPRM. Um, firstly, obviously, since COVID, uh, uh, there has been supply chain disruptions, and they basically have highlighted the, the importance of having a robust management of supply chain risk. Uh, because it impacts uh, the company's operations and its bottom line. So that's that's a key factor that we've seen. The rise in cyber attacks, obviously, data breaches, uh, we've seen that across the board as well. Uh, again, uh, mandating that companies are managing this risk appropriately. Uh, sanctions risk is, is another one, I would say. Um, since the war in Ukraine, there's an elevated risk of working with sanctioned entities. So you see a lot of these different factors um, you know, playing playing the market. Um, but basically, there's one key aspect that I really would want to highlight, I would say, which is the increasing expectations from stakeholders, I would say. You know, people in politics, um, they require businesses to operate more ethically and be mindful of their impact on the world. So you basically can no longer shift your responsibility. And as a company, you know, you are responsible for your own footprint, not only your own footprint to your own operations, but also the footprint to your value chain. And this has really changed the dynamic, I would say, uh, in in the market. And regulators, I don't know whether you know it's regulators that 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 started this, or or it's people and stakeholders that that have uh, an increased focus on this and increased expectations. But essentially, regulators are pushing also these topics, as you can see through various uh, regulations um, that that are currently um, yeah, that are currently there. Yeah, and maybe just to continue, Ben thought is. While regulations have long imposed, imposed responsibilities for such things as anti-bribery, corruption, and sanctions risks, new regulations uh, have also been uh, introduced recently, and this would be CSRD 
Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, DORA, Digital Operational Resilience Act, EU Deforestation Regulation, and also uh, maybe it's worth mentioning, of course, Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, CSDD. All of them really include uh, requirements for companies to have due diligence pr processes and procedures and third-party risk management uh, platform uh, in, pl in place. Yeah, lots of, indeed, uh, lots of new regulations and, and I do see a lot of companies uh, now coming in, in the scope thereof, either for CSRD, uh, the, the, the next wave already this year, but, but certainly next year as well. Perhaps, Christina, when we talk about CSRD and, and CSDD being linked to that, um, perhaps good to explain how these regulations really impact these third-party risk management practices. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, uh, uh, due diligence directive, of course, has a, a bigger impact on TPRM. But let's maybe first start with CSRD. As you mentioned, it's uh, it's already there and uh, companies need to prepare for it. Uh, CSRD requires companies to perform a double materiality assessment, as you know, uh, where uh, companies need to evaluate what sustainability matters impact the business and where their business impacts people and the planet in its value chain. And once it's done, companies also need to report material impacts, risks, and opportunities, IROs, uh, that include value chain information. And actually, to succeed in both activities, uh, in double materiality assessment and in reporting, companies must identify the dat data that needs to be obtained from third parties, establish a robust data collection uh, process, and uh, then assess uh, the gathered information. And a good TPRM prog program can support this objective. When it comes to CS D, this is a regulation that really requires companies to identify and assess where necessary, prioritize, prevent, and mitigate, as well as bring to an end and minimize actual and potential adverse environmental and human rights impacts throughout their value chains. This regulation in particular is focused on strengthening co corporate accountability by establishing a mandatory due diligence framework. So also here, the regulation requires companies not only to manage their own sustainability objectives, but also ensure that their third parties and the entire value chain align with these standards. Yeah. So uh, thank you, thank you, Christina and Ben, for that. So I, I think we we've already covered uh, CSRD in the past and established there uh, with, with Thomas de Kuiper at the time uh, mm -hmm. that, that CFOs are typically well suited uh, to to be involved in that sustainability information. Um, in in your viewpoint, and and I do see some links already. Yeah, but uh, in your viewpoint, is there any? Uh, reason why uh, CFOs should should be focused on the topic of uh, third party risk management? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. Um, first, maybe in many companies, the CFO uh, provides oversight to the risk management program. And in my view, the third party risk is part of that equation as well. Agreed. Uh, one, one area. Um, and then obviously there are certain risk domains that are definitely in scope for CFOs, right? Um, if we think about uh, whether or not uh, certain third parties are financially stable uh, or are capable, of, uh, are, are capable of paying all the invoices, uh, whether suppliers are reliable as well uh, and, and also are credit worthy uh, to meet uh, the requirements and the purchases that, that the company has done. So all of these different elements are risk domains, I would say, that fall within the purview of, of the CFO. But in a way, it's also a little bit besides the point, because in many companies, what we've seen at least is that the, the, the broader third party risk management program is, is conducted in silos. There's different functional areas that are doing certain areas of, uh, of, of, of third party risk management. Um, let's say a certain third party or a supplier or a customer within, let's say their functional area will be uh, in scope of the due diligence. But information is not shared across all of these uh, functional areas, and it ultimately leads to inconsistencies and inefficiencies. Also, just because the way uh, you know, the third party risk management program or due diligence or risk rating is performed is just, uh, it's just not consistent. It's different between all of those different functional areas. And I think here, the, the, the CFO together with the COO, really, if, if, if I'm honest, really has an important role to align those different functional areas. 
and, and, and really champion change and drive the necessary changes, I would say, within within the organizations. And and we've seen as well in, in conversations that we've we've had with clients that, that the CFO is also the budget budget holder for this for this type of work. And maybe to touch upon what you just said, Rula, as well, we were talking about the CSRD and and and, and non-financial reporting obligations. You know, CFOs bear responsibility in that area. Um, it's it's a new area. It's not always welcomed as much by by CFOs. This this non-financial reporting it's considered something compliance, but in any case, yeah, there's a requirement to report on uh, as as Christina pointed out, um, IRO. Uh, uh, impacts, risk, and opportunities, not only through your own operations, but also in the value chain, which means you need to get uh, to certain data points in uh, from your value chain or gather uh, data points from your value chain. So, yeah, the CFO ultimately bears a certain responsibility there as well. Um, so, but, yeah. No, correct, uh, Ben. And, and, and I've had a, a previous session before before the holiday break. Uh, where one of the key topics that the CFO, uh, some CFOs also have on their agenda is really breaking down the silos as part of a planning uh, yeah. and budgeting and forecasting. Yeah. So, so to be agreed with all of you, all of what you're saying here, it's breaking down the silos and connecting those organizations or parts of the organization with mm -hmm. themselves, eh? uh, knowing that the left hand knows what uh, hand knows what the right hand does in essence with an organization. Yeah, no, indeed, uh, it, it's all about you know, operational excellence. I mean, it's, it's a big word, to, uh, but essentially you would want a process or a program to work efficiently, that it's integrated, that every functional area in the organization has a good understanding of what their responsibility is and how it fits into the broader, I would say, program. Um, and yeah, when working in silos, that that's very hard. And I think the CFO is well positioned and and also just um yeah it has an important role to play to align all of those different uh functional areas and to streamline and harmonize uh, that's actually what it what it comes down to it, yeah fully fully agreed fully agreed and and it's a lot of uh, a lot of effort a lot of change management but but the is uh, indeed uh, i see that they are ideally pursued uh position to to drive that that cost functional change uh, and mm -hmm. and ensure that uh, together with the board of directors, obviously making sure that that compliance remains high on the agenda uh, mm -hmm. for the company. But then, uh, when we spoke also earlier in preparation, that 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 compliance is tailored, that it's fit for purpose and and and, and kept in a pragmatic way uh, for the company and tailored to the company, um, striking really a balance there. Um, but perhaps uh, we we've already gotten a, an introduction into third party risk management. Can we perhaps? Uh, Christina delve also into the the various steps um how how uh, what the basics are uh, how how it can help manage uh, the business uh, with the third with the risks related to third parties uh, in practice yeah of course in short uh, i would say that um TPRM is a program that involves certain steps so starting from identifying assessing monitoring and mitigating risk as risks associated with third parties and that is done throughout the entire relationship life cycle. Yeah. So, so various steps in in the whole process, I, I guess, as we as we define it, uh, mm -hmm. at EWC. Perhaps can we talk a bit about those uh, various steps to make it a bit more clearer for the audience? Let's let's start with the first step uh, of intaking and onboarding the third party, and during this process, uh, companies need to capture and retain necessary information about the third party and perform an initial assessment. So basically, it's done to determine the level of scrutiny required based on risk domains, criticality to business operations and other factors uh, that needs to be performed before committing to a deal, before signing the contract with this new, new third party, new supplier, for example. Um, so and I get this this is it's crucial if we look at at making it fit for purpose um that we that, that the company strikes the right balance here obviously yeah I think so if I, if I may indeed I mean essentially you want the company to have a program which is focused on the right things right so you want to look at the company's uh, nature of business uh, you want to look at what their value chain is what their third party universe is and then from there you you want to understand okay but where are inherently the risks yep. within the organization right 
Um, and this this is broad. So we look at risks uh, holistically, uh, essentially. Yeah. Uh, but you can narrow it down to specific risk domains, for instance, if you have a company, for example, that is active in engineering or in construction and is performing construction works all around the world, you know that in that type of business, that nature of business, anti-bribery and corruption will be a major risk domain to be taken into consideration, but as well as is uh, sanctions, for instance. Yeah. However, if you have, let's say, a biotech company or a life sciences company and they rely uh, on third parties to perform, uh, uh, I would say, research uh, and development. Well, then you want to ensure that those laboratories that you're working with or academic institutions or, or whatnot are basically uh, working appropriately with the correct ISO standards, um, the, the, the quality uh, uh, of, the, of, of the laboratories should be verified. So that's a, a key and major area of risk because it will also lead to a certain competitive advantage. So you look at all of that basically to understand, okay, what is our risk? Where do we have inherently the biggest area of risk? And from there, you're gonna develop a program to, to, to manage that risk really, yeah. right? Then Christina, I've also heard you say, well, a lot of, various sources that are that are screened uh, to get there uh, yeah for sure let's cover the sources so uh, you can divide it into internal and external sources that for instance uh, imagine you have a, a client um, supplier whatever and uh, basically you would like to determine if it's on the sanction list and in practical uh, in our like cases that we have uh, helped clients implement uh, is uh, that uh, they establish the connection to the external sources to consult whether the company is sanctioned or not. And if it's sanctioned, then, well, there is no further need to continue the conversation with the third party, then you just stop, you block the uh, further um, relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for example, this kind of system could also retrieve information if the company is publicly owned. And this could be relevant for the uh, for the anti-bribery and corruption uh, risk scoring. Um, these connections could be also used to to screen for adverse media. Uh, yeah, and uh, that's something we also see a lot of our clients do. Um, and maybe yeah. and maybe another one as well, which is particularly relevant, I would say, to the CFO is if if uh, yeah at onboarding you basically do a credit check uh, mm -hmm. or monitor credit risk. The, so the, the the third party is onboarded and and it runs uh, against certain databases such as Dun and Bradstreet or, or or gradient systems, and as a result, you immediately get feedback as to what the yeah. if there is a potential credit risk with this respective third party that you're going to work with. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but internal sources are used as well. Uh, for example, let's take a chocolate manufacturing company that is uh, that has like found a new supplier of cocoa from uh, Southeast Asia. And in Southeast Asia, and uh, considering the nature of goods that would be uh, supplied, uh, one could say that trade compliance risks exist, right? Uh, human rights risks as well, and uh, environmental risks for sure could also apply. So that means that uh, EU deforestation regulation would potentially apply. And this identification of inherent risk that you are basically doing based on your internal uh, sources, based on the data that is provided by business, uh, will drive the further uh, due diligence procedures uh, that would be based on the risk level and uh, specific context of the of the plant relationship. Okay, thank you. That's, that, that's very useful to go into the, the first step there. And But perhaps for my understanding, are are all Belgian organizations required to perform uh, such a background review of all of all their third parties? Well, no, <laughs> I would say no. Um, uh, it's not really effective or efficient to, I mean, to conduct a risk assessment or, or due diligence, uh, I would say, on, on all your uh, third parties, right? Again, when we talked about it before, uh, you want to focus on the right thing. So with this initial risk assessment or risk identification, I would say, you try to identify um, which areas are are important, which compliance risks exist, uh, which environmental human rights, anti-bribery and corruption risks exist. And if, yeah, it turns out that a certain supplier is not critical to the business and, and, and none of these risk domains actually apply, then obviously 
that's it. You 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 just onboard the supplier or or or, uh, or the third party and 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 you take it from there. Um, but if there's an elevated risk, as I as I said before, the example that I gave, you know, a, a construction company, let's say that is working with a temporary labor agency in in a certain country where where you know that there are human rights violations. Mm -hmm. Well, then obviously you need to you need to perform due diligence on this temporary labor agency. But when you onboard, um, let's say a, a supplier with from 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 Belgium, for instance, where just delivery of certain uh, stationery, let's say, yeah. uh, you don't you don't need to do uh, all, all of due diligence, right? So so again, this 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 risk identification piece determines what level of due diligence you should perform, and you know most of the third parties that you onboard do not require extensive due diligence to be performed, but yeah, those where there is an elevated risk, and then again, which risk domains apply to your business is to be determined. But then you perform due diligence. So no, no, you, you want it to be pragmatic, and in, in, in no shape or form you want uh, all of the third parties to go through extensive due diligence procedures. And as an example, if we can provide this for the joint ventures, let's say you're about to partner with a competitor to deliver a project to a client, and uh, as part of this project. Um, both, uh, both teams from uh, two companies will work closely together. During the first uh, this first phase, uh, it's critical to to actually understand uh, that there are some fundamental uh, inherent risks related to this kind of a setup, and this could be uh, IP theft, uh, antitrust concerns, data security issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Uh, during the due diligence, uh, it's essential actually to analyze these uh, potential risks and then uh, tailor uh, specific uh, mitigation strategies. Yeah, so I think uh, for the risk uh, identification, uh, we've covered this step. Okay, no, I think this was this was very helpful from, from what the first step that, that you've suggested uh, is, is risk identification and really that, that target fit for purpose based approach, I would say. A risk-based approach to due diligence. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's that's good to hear. Eh? Um, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, the next step, perhaps, uh, um, perhaps Ben to 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 take on there. Yeah, the next step is really perform due diligence, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so, w with the due diligence itself, you you basically um, uh, would connect with the respective third party, let's say a supplier to obtain additional clarifications, questions, or discuss certain questions, how they are mitigating certain areas of risk. Um, for instance, when, when you talk about uh, cybersecurity or inf information security, as, as, I, as I talked about before, if you're in biotech and life sciences and you're working uh, with a research and academic institution, you're gonna share a whole host of intellectual property. So you would wanna understand how they how they deal with that, how they how they keep that safe, um, and, and their cybersecurity protocol. So those are the type of questions that you would then be asking them. Um, when, when talking about anti-bribery and corruption, for instance, again, you, you would want to understand whether they have an anti-bribery and corruption policy, um, whether they interact with public officials, yes or no, and uh, whether they have a certain internal control framework on, uh, on, on, on their interactions with the public officials and so on and so forth. So you want to make yourself comfortable with, okay, how, how, is, how is our third party actually dealing with these risks? Um, and and then it will help you identify where there is an, uh, what the residual risk ultimately is and what you should do with that, right? Because it's not all about inherent risk scoring and residual risk scoring, but it's just really identification of potential areas of concern, and then uh, defining methods to to yeah to mitigate those. Um, we've seen in, in, in a lot of cases, for instance, again, if I go to biotech and life sciences, that when then they work with a certain academic institution, um, they they will only enter into a contract and that's that's the next phase after due diligence after the due diligence i'm sorry they will only enter into a contract when uh, a corrective action plan has been completed right which has has been defined on the result or on the basis of the due diligence that was performed before so really that's that's due diligence it, it's questions being asked it, it, it's looking at those different risk domains and assessing how the third party is dealing with those and whether there's any you know r residual risk uh, to to your company yeah but which which ultimately means that that you would need to map out, if I properly understand, your your entire universe of third parties as a company to to do that. I would think is that a critical step um, to make sure that you can get to the scoring part. Uh, I would say yes. 
um, in a way, um, I always look at these things from a, from a, a you know, 50,000 foot perspective, so to say, is, okay, we are establishing a third party risk management program and you want it to be focused on the right areas of risk. But then you need to understand, okay, which, with which third parties are we actually working? Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of these regulations, such as the CSRD and the CSDDD, you know, they've put emphasis on it's not only about your own operations, but it's about your value chain. So you need to understand what is your value chain and, and where do we have risks within our value chain? So for me, it all starts with that, you know, with that identification and the this understanding what is our third party universe? What does it look like? Uh, and then from there, trying to understand, OK, where are our risks now and, 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 and yeah, manage those. Okay, and in terms of the, the the risk scoring process, Christina, what are some of the complexities that that you've come across? Yeah, actually, it's one of the um, like there are plenty of changes, and uh, this is one of the most complex uh, areas in setting up the uh, the TPRM uh, program in general. So, for instance, uh, many companies do not have a defined methodology to the risk scoring at all. And sometimes uh, we see that businesses, uh, they just determine the uh, level of risk based on their own experience and their own uh, beliefs. And this, uh, I would, we cannot even call it a risk scoring, I would say. Uh, so it, it becomes the risk assessment becomes really uh, subjective. Uh, since it's not based on, on uh, any consistent set of uh, in internal or external data that you retrieve from your sources. Yeah. Okay. Okay, but let's 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 assume uh, in, 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 in for the sake of all the various steps that, that we have here, let's let's indeed assume that a, a company has, has done the necessary risk assessment, has, has done a risk scoring and, and ultimately um, has found no red flags or mitigated those. Um, can can the company then proceed to the contracting process? I think the next step, or the logical next step here. Yeah, of course. I think, yeah, contracting, in, in most cases, when you perform a due diligence, it doesn't prohibit you from signing a contract afterwards, but it just allows you to identify, hey, where are our risks? And then you, you put certain uh, mitigation uh, measures into the contract, right? So, for instance, certain anti bribery and corruption clauses, data protection clauses, qu quality requirements, uh, you impose certain cybersecurity protocols. You want those provisions to go into the contract as well. Uh, but also, you, you want to include performance metrics, for instance, and, and clauses on how you're going to monitor the third parties. One of the things that I've seen in Belgium is most contracts basically have right to audit clauses, but yet very little companies actually invoke those right to audit clauses. Whereas my position in this is, well, the clause is there, it only will lead to a good relationship. And so, yeah, companies should invoke those cla clauses more than that they're doing now, certainly again, for those areas of risks, which are, which are elevated. So you basically take all of the findings and observations from your due diligence into your contract negotiations. And then from there, basically ensure that you're, 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 you're mitigating certain, certain risks. And there's many examples of this, right? I, I touched upon a couple of clauses there out of data security protocols or, 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 uh, you know, bribery and corruption clauses, but it could also be something like, Hey, um, we're going to change the liability cap in this, uh, in this contract. Or uh, one that, that I oftentimes say is, um, you know, you have a risk working with a third party, but what if that third party subcontracts to yet another third party and you don't have visibility over this? So you could include a, a clause in the contract to say, hey, if you're going to further subcontract, you need to notify us and we need to give you prior approval. That again, gives you control, gives you oversight mm -hmm. as to whom at, in, in the, yeah, or what parties or companies in the value chain are also providing services to you. Because oftentimes you're exposed not to your direct third party, but through your indirect third party. So, so a clause whereby you need to pre-approve a certain subcontractor, again, gives you an additional level of, uh, of security, for instance. 
And, and it's also important for, in some cases to, that specific contractual clauses are also passed down and included in the agreements between the main contractor and the subcontractors, for example, uh, some relevant uh, safety and health regulations um, to maintain the, the, the safe working environment in general. So it could be also one of the things that you need to keep in mind. Yeah, and the right to audit clause, for instance. Oftentimes, you have a right to audit to your contractor, but then there's no right to audit the subcontractor. And that's an issue mm -hmm. in a lot of different uh, circumstances. Uh, so, yeah, those are the things you want to carry through to your contracting uh, process. Yes. Okay, no, good Good to know, good to know. And uh, as you are aware, I have a, as an auditor, I have a background uh, within pharmaceuticals, so I'm, I'm used to seeing those very extensive contracts uh, that they enter. Mm -hmm. But then also, it's uh, something I sometimes observe that 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 not all the contracts are then sometimes some some crucial provisions uh, with those third party partners are are really overlooked. Eh? Some complexity mm -hmm. of the contracts that sometimes is, but also lack of staffing turnover. Uh, or have familiarity with some of the clauses. So I, I, I would, would want to add to that, that indeed, uh, aside from entering into the contract, managing the contract, I think, is yeah. also important. Huh? And perhaps we can touch later on after we go through all the phase, but perhaps we can touch later on some of the tools that could, could help uh, with the performance there. Uh, yeah, perhaps indeed. When, when after the contract is closed, so does the process end there? Or, or how do we then move beyond that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for some for some companies, indeed, uh, they prefer to 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 think that it's ended and then they just uh, exercise like the, the contract and that's it. But normally, and the best practice is that once the contract is signed and the relationship is uh, formalized, and businesses still need to keep an eye on this relationship, and ongoing monitoring ensures that the third party meets performance and compliance standards. It involves some regular checkups, uh, reviews, audits, and assessments, uh, just to track the key performance indicators and uh, compliance with uh, with contract obligations and any emerging new risks. Maybe if I, if I may contribute here as well as indeed, I mean, it, what we oftentimes see obviously is the lack of resources or formality around this monitoring. And we are very well aware that this yeah, this is 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 difficult at times, uh, right? Um, to dedicate a certain amount of time or resources to effectively monitoring. Um, but here again, we, we try to draw the line with with the risk assessment, right? So you really don't want to monitor your low risk third parties, but you want to have a good sense of where your higher risks are, and so really focus on those areas of high high risk. And again, it should be pragmatic and and. And, and that's why that risk assessment is so critical to the entire process, because again, monitoring for monitoring is obviously not something that we would advocate for, but yeah. you know, having a good sense of where your high risks are, that's where you want to dedicate some time and resources to, to monitoring. But that we, we are very well aware that this is this oftentimes an issue, uh, you know, dedicating time and resources to this. Yeah, for example, at one of our clients, uh, we've implemented the tech uh, enabled process whereby mm -hmm. all of these third parties uh, they interact with effectively all of the third parties, it's like thousands and thousands. They are being screened overnight for sanctions since uh, sanction risk is really high on the agenda for this particular company. They, they, they prefer to monitor all of their third parties. So how it works is that as soon as a supplier is confirmed to be mentioned in the in the sanction list, it gets blocked, and it gets blocked uh, not just in one system somewhere in TPRM system, but it gets blocked in the finance system as well. So uh, this could also happen if if the UBOs or uh, key principles of the company uh, gets get uh, sanctioned as well. Um, yeah, I think I think technology can help here. Uh, the example that you know just highlighted. You know, you're going to sanction screening and sanction monitoring is a difficult feat, right? Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes still done very manually. But here we were able to use technology to have all of the third parties in their system be screened against these sanction lists overnight. So as soon as a, as there is a change in, in sanction regimes in OFAC or, 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 or and other lists, essentially the system will flag such and we'll flag it for follow-up. And if it's a false positive, then all fine. 
But if it's a, a true sanction, obviously, um, it get it gets confirmed. And in this particular case, we were able to integrate the technology within the existing IT landscape, within the existing ERP landscape. And as a result, as soon as there's a sanction hit, even when it's not confirmed yet, but uh, it, it's just a hit, you cannot continue to operate with this uh, respective third party or supplier. So you cannot order, you cannot pay, you cannot sign any contracts, uh, none of that. So this is this is obviously full integration. But again, it shows that, you know, through tech enablement, you could basically uh, achieve a lot of, uh, you know, efficiency and competitive advantage. Exactly. Then. And this is one of the examples where indeed, uh, based on that specific client of ours, uh, which, which was on the I would say on the higher end for the sanctions listing. Yeah, it does, uh, the technology, I think, is, is great and can help. Mm -hmm. It's also technology needs to be fit for purpose. No? And, and, and I, I, I hear you as well. And indeed, all the risks that, that companies are uh, exposed to are a bit dynamic, I would say, uh, mm -hmm. in nature. So monitoring there is also, I think, important. Uh, indeed, yeah, indeed, they're, they're very dynamic. Uh, again, um, you could be, I mean, certain companies may be put on a sanction list from one day to the other. And so you need to be to made, be made aware of such. But there's also uh, just daily screening for adverse media, for instance, uh, companies that get in the news for certain human rights violations or environmental uh, issues uh, somewhere around the world. Again, the technology uh, and, and the, the screening or the daily screening that you could achieve with this um, and you could be made aware of these type of issues um, uh, overnight and and it helps you obviously to to mitigate that risk going forward and and there's a lot of reputational risk also to be considered right so again risks are inherently dynamic it, it changes and so these tools and technology help you monitor for those risks uh, on an ongoing basis and and this is really what you yeah yeah what you should aim for uh in the future i would say yeah and also in practice, we see that a lot of companies reduce their uh, due diligence effort yeah. uh, at all once uh, the initial onboarding and initial approval for the relationship uh, has been obtained. So, and yeah, this could uh, result in a very uh, poor situations when uh, with quality issues, operational disruptions, and all this risk that we already mentioned in the very beginning. Yeah, indeed, it's true. I mean, oftentimes when we th when we speak about thirty party risk management, sorry, there's a such an emphasis on on well, on one hand, risk identification, but then mostly on performing due diligence. Yeah. Yet there is actually kind of step four and five, right? Step three being contracts, and you sign contracts. We we talked about that, but four and five really is about ongoing monitoring and about ultimately ending the relationship and certain termination protocols. Those two steps, like the ongoing monitoring uh, and, and the termination protocols are often not a part of the equation when we're having this conversation. Yet, obviously, we advocate as consultants for, I mean, the full spectrum of of, uh, of, of the process, right? So but it, it's, I, I echo Ben, it's as, as an older, what I, what I see often is, is indeed a lot of you do uh up until the phase of, of signing to the contract getting to the contract and then and then afterwards uh, not 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 necessarily the same level of effort is always done um, and perhaps uh, i heard you indeed say the final step final phase is is looking at terminating or renewing the contract uh, but perhaps certain elements to consider there on on that termination or renewal yeah um it's really necessary actually to update the risk assessment uh, uh, once they, the contract has been expired. And we, we would say, as Ben already actually mentioned, it's really critical um, since the environment, the business environment changes, the regulatory environment uh, requirements could also change. And uh, so therefore the general risk landscape, as we call it, uh, changes. And um, basically you just need to perform reassessment to ensure that third party still meets uh, meets your standards of quality uh, compliance and uh, yeah rel reliability in general. Yeah, I would say if the contract, then I think you mentioned just before, Christina, if the contract expires, but it's really if, if the due diligence expires, there's yeah, a little indeed. lapses, but happens first. yeah, it's indeed whichever happens first. But if, if the contract expires, obviously you need to, yeah, then uh, have your appropriate termination protocols. And here we often sign, oftentimes see issues as well, right? Where if you share certain confidential information, uh, proprietary information that it's not returned, 
uh, or that certain access rights to systems and, and and we as consultants oftentimes have that right we have access to uh, the systems uh, mm -hmm. uh, from the client that those access rights are not uh, invoked anymore um, those things right so really having termination protocols are critical but for those relationships that continue and and, and that's oftentimes the case because yeah, sometimes you don't have necessarily a valid contract, but it's just ongoing relationship. Yeah, well, then after a certain period of time, you need to reassess. You yeah. need to assess whether or not the risk, yeah, the risk level and score that you that you had in the beginning is still is still valid, and whether now there are certain changes that uh, that yeah that you should be mindful of. And yeah, maybe just yeah. provide a yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 because I uh, was just about to end. Uh, uh, just going back, I think on step for the monitoring because in an ideal world the ongoing monitoring would probably already highlight that those those changes to risks uh, but again on uh, uh, mm -hmm. ultimate uh, utopia world probably uh, yeah uh, well it uh, really much depends on the uh, like level of robustness of your monitoring activities but for instance, if you don't use technology, it's really difficult to have a broad monitoring scope, right? And um, yeah, you would capture only a limited number of uh, attributes, parameters, and it's uh, it, it is more about tracking the most critical red flags rather than conducting full scope assessments. Uh, so monitoring doesn't replace the reassessment. Um, yeah also yeah as as i mentioned before the setup of the, the new relationship could change uh and uh that's the example i wanted to provide is the company is entering into a new supply uh, agreement with the existing supplier but the value of of the new relationship of the new agreement uh, is much higher and uh, it covers a uh, new type of goods that you've uh, never purchased from this supplier before and these details need to be analyzed and uh, scrutinized for, for potential risks, such as the supplier's capacity to meet the increased volume. Uh, if they have enough experience in uh, pr producing this type of new goods, uh, whether they are rela reliable enough in delivering the new types of goods. Um, yeah, and maybe there are some specific regulatory requirements associated with the new goods. Um, yeah, also you would uh, like to assess probably the financial implications of this larger agreement uh, on the supplier separations to avoid uh, situations when when suppliers just say that, uh, yeah, we will uh, we will supply everything and it will be done by that time. But actually, if you look at their financials, you see that it would be really, really a big challenge for them that they, they are highly likely in, uh, not meeting the deadline. Yeah. Yeah, circumstances change, right? So, yeah, the different type of, I mean, and also the, the relationship with the supplier changes, right? As, as Christina pointed out, type of goods that you deliver, the type of services. Yeah, these things are dynamic, as we said before. So, yeah, you need somewhat of a formal process to reassess or, yeah, use data points as we, as we started off from in the beginning, right? There's internal sources or data that you capture there's external yeah you, at some at some point you need to put that together and see whether or not your initial risk assessment still is is valid and uh typically we would advise to do a reassessment every so many years um depending obviously on the the, the risk level that the third party had in the beginning okay. Uh, no. okay no no very clear i think uh, having it seems like we have touched then indeed on the on the five major steps that that you have huh, in the in the methodology, so to say, and mm -hmm. have those five steps. Uh, but I've heard I've heard uh, a lot on that third party risk management, but but that it is a complex endeavor. Uh, a lot of data points. I've heard you just say it, Ben and in Christina. A lot of data points, a lot of assessing, a lot of scoring, analyzing, a lot of data, often with links. So uh, perhaps perhaps good. To, to look at at technology um, and how that can play can play a role um, in in this whole process. Uh, yeah, no, indeed. I mean, we're all we're, we're I think we always will advocate for technology. Um, but yeah, coming out of of this session and the podcast that we're having, I think in the main message that I, I want to bring across is. I think a lot of companies have a lot of good practices already in place, but harmonizing and streamlining those processes, that's the first thing that you should do, right? I think there's 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 a lot that you could do even without technology. 
But if you were to implement technology, uh, and, and again, as I said, we would advocate for technology always, certainly in this digital era. Um, but if you were to, to use uh, technology, and, and it, it's really an, an enabler of, of, of third-party risk management. I think plenty of examples we gave before, right, where we said, hey, uh, use technology to, on a daily basis, uh, screen all your third parties for sanctions, right, or yeah. for adverse media or for credit risk. These are things that allow you to scale the scope of your program, right? You'd be able to monitor a, a much larger volume of third parties, yet at the same time do that with the same amount of resources that you had in the company, right? And beyond that, I think just technology can help uh, in, in various areas and to streamline that process, right? So we talked about risk scoring. Well, basically the, the technology can help you automate that risk scoring because you have certain internal, internal data points, you have external data points, you attribute a certain risk score to all of that, and there's a methodology behind. And the system will say if it's a low, a medium, or a high, and what due diligence procedures to ensue. It will help you, for instance, reach out to your uh, third parties. For instance, hey, we talked about you want to ask a bunch of questions. Well, basically, the system will automatically send a bunch of questions or a bunch of questions or the questionnaire to the third party you responded to. Technology will also help you, for instance, um, in uh, analysis of adverse media. Voila, you indeed. also mentioned, uh, and it uh, tool can help you to focus on those uh, articles that are really relevant for specific risk domains. Yeah, and also with AI, uh, that could also perform some kind of a pre-assessment of the uh, negative publicity before the actual person, like the compliance manager or someone, uh, performs a review of that. That is also very helpful and really uh, minimizes the time required to perform the uh, the assessment. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, as I said, I mean, technology is, is an enabler, I would say. Um, in any case, any company should should look at how they're currently, you know, managing their third party risks, and and there's always going to be opportunity to improve. But if you think about really establishing uh, a competitive advantage, or at least to achieve more with the same amount of resources, I, I think considering technology should always be part of the equation. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. And, and as, as Christine, I think, very relevantly highlighted also, I think AI yeah, is, is up and coming. Um, and, and, and as I'm sure, you, you gave a very small flavor, but that, that it could, could seriously assist there as well. Uh, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe a quick example, sorry for cutting you off there. Uh, no, no, good, good. I like examples, Ben. So Yeah, so some of the questions that we've had, for instance, were, hey, we, we get so many questionnaires now from our clients or from our third parties that, that we need to respond to. So it's not only a matter of, uh, you know, doing due diligence on the third parties and as a company, you sending out questionnaire is also getting a lot of questions here. Mm -hmm. And AI could help uh, populate, I would say, uh, the answers to those questionnaires, um, for instance, um, because there's a yeah, uh, there's information that is available on the website. There's information that is available on, on SharePoints and internally policies. and AI policies, for instance. And basically AI could help you respond to all of those questionnaires that you're getting from your clients, for instance. So um, that's also uh, an area uh, that, I mean, that we've been working on uh, quite a bit the last couple of uh, months, I would say. Because that's a key concern that we that we get from 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 the companies that we're working with. All these questionnaires, all these questions, it's hard to keep up and keep track. Well, you know, a lot of this can be automated, and uh, we are, yeah, it should be something to take into consideration. Okay, no, thanks, thanks a lot, Ben, for that last uh, last example, a final example, a, a good one. So, so thanks a lot. Thanks just mm -hmm. in general, uh, Ben and Christina, for for being on the podcast and. For walking us through, I, I would say the five steps uh, that we that we've shared uh, oh. here, and and as well, I think the the very important role that a, a CFO can play for his organization, for his company, along with some other members of the board, obviously. But his his main role, I've learned, is breaking down the silos uh, to a certain extent, making sure oh. that it it remains a. Uh, a pragmatic uh, fit for purpose, especially I would say uh, fit for purpose methodology and, and, and assessment, a risk management program. Um, and then also the, the important role that a technology can play 
And again, there also for me, the key word I've taken away is search for purpose and, 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 and how we, we, for example, can also help our clients uh, with that, yeah, making it search for purpose and not necessarily doing the gold plating. Yeah. And that, that all the managing all the operational challenges, like the supply chain disruptions we've talked about, and we've seen the cybersecurity threats, quality issues. And then obviously it's, but I don't want to put it into a, a compliance only exercise because I think it does, it can add significant value to companies and knowing your contracts, knowing your suppliers, um, and mitigating the risks that are. So I do not want to put it only as a, as a compliance item with all the various uh, new new regulations, uh, DORA, CSRD, CSDD, but it's also really a, a, a tool for the company to help manage its risk. So thank you for that. I think I, I've learned a lot today. I hope our, our listeners as well. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for, for giving me that insight and our listeners as well. And, and for the listeners, I, I do hope that, that, that you learn a lot on uh, the importance of third party risk management and, and how you could take action um, in making it come to life for your company, for really eh, your fit for purpose uh, exercise. Ben, Christina, thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. And mm-hmm. uh, hope to see you next time. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for joining us and see you next time.